Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom? We have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of His name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to preach to you on the title, The Gospel of God. Please stand, uh, remain standing as we pray. Father, we thank you for this passage. We thank you for these seven verses that open up for us the letter to the Romans. As it was an introduction to a letter, God, we recognize today that it's not just a mere introduction, but that this contains your word to them. And just the same to us today. Father, I pray that you would help me as I preach, that I would preach your truth, not my own ideas. I pray that your people would have hearts that are open and receptive, that we would hear your word, that it would transform us and change us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. The, the best stories often involve a transformation of a hopeless character into something magnificent. Think of the stories that you grew up with. Cinderella, a servant transformed into a princess. Beauty and the Beast. A cursed beast restored as a young man. Princess and the frog. From an amphibian to royalty. Now here's the story of all of us. From a sinner to a saint. There are two big themes in these first seven verses of Romans that I want to draw out. The first one is the gospel, and the second one is that of what the gospel does for us, transform sinners into saints. Since the gospel has been fulfilled in Christ, we are transformed into a whole new people. Imagine with me, it is 55 A.D., and you were born and raised in the great famous city of Rome. But for you, it's just old Rome. It's all you've ever known. You're supposed to live a luxury of pleasure, a, a life of luxury and a, a life of pleasure, but, but often fear is a better way to characterize what you feel about your life. The Caesars who rule your empire have a long history of murder and corruption. In your city, the bodies of the poor are, as one historian writes, easily sucked into the gravitational field of dishonor associated with outright slavery. The culture you grew up in is both brutal and hypersexualized. Becoming a man for you meant going down to the bathhouses as an adolescent youth and committing acts of sexual immorality with other adolescent youths. Slave boys and slave girls are sex objects, and they are required in your city to submit to their owners. 
Your city is a cruel zone of free access for anyone who has power to come and to engage in any and all perverted desire. Your city's seaside community boasts luxurious villas with heated pools, and there the rich come to indulge in their wildest desires. An entire structure exists for the worship of gods, and it's dedicated with all of these statues to earthly pleasures, where people come and participate in earthly pleasures. Idleness and pleasure seem to be your city's two core values. And religion, let's talk about the religion you grew up with. The cult religion of your city, Rome, is very different than cities or or religions today. There is little to no morality attached to your religion. Approval from the gods doesn't uh, consist of living some kind of moral life, but rather approval from the gods consists of accurate observance of each ritual, most of which, or many of which, include wicked vices. Each god requires an image, an altar, a statue, statue, a temple. And this religion, this cult religion that you grew up with, is actually what binds your family together. It's what binds the people to their rulers and to their gods. This is the world that you grew up in. Oh, but now you're a Christian. Now you're part of this little church that feels so weak and so helpless and even so foolish to the world that you grew up in. Your friends don't understand it. Those that you grew up with are still going about their old business, living their old lives. They don't understand why you've given up worship of the gods. And you wonder, is Christianity really, is it really something? Is it real? Is Christianity really enough? Like, is there, in this faith that we're talking about, in this change, is is there actual hope for my neighbor Is there hope for those who I grew up with? Is there hope for me? You wonder at times. Is it worth the sacrifice that this new faith requires? Oh, and by the way, your faith often feels so feeble. You're not even sure if you're going to wake up the next morning with faith. Now, is that just ancient Rome? I would argue that the same Questions apply for us today. Oh yeah, today's sins might look different. But in no way do we live in a society that is better. You know, our society today hasn't trusted God's word, but just the opposite. They've trusted their feelings. Our society hasn't bowed its knee to God, but rather just the opposite. Our society has bowed to its desires. And so we wonder at times, is Christianity really enough? Really enough? Is, it, is it real? Is it worth the sacrifice of, of my, 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 my whole life? Is there hope for my neighbor? Hope for those who I grew up with? Is there hope for me in this world? And will my feeble faith even survive? Now, it's in this world that Paul, in verse 7, says you are called to be saints. Called to be saints. How? Well, the answer is nothing less than the gospel of God. And you too are called to be saints in Baltimore. How? How? The answer is nothing less than the gospel of God. 
Like I said, we're beginning a series in the book of Romans. It's a letter. It's a long letter. Romans is famous for its length. It's about seven times longer than the average letter written of its day. It's famous, famous for its depth. You know, Rome, uh, Romans can be endlessly mined for its theological gold. This is why, you know, some pastors take years through Romans. I think I saw a Babylon Bee article, if you know Babylon Bee, it's like a spoof Christian news website, and it said, Reformed pastor took, just finished 57 years in the book of Romans. Um, John Piper, I think, took eight years in Romans. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones took 12 years preaching through the book of Romans. And it's, it's because it's just, it's, you know, you, every verse, every, every line of every verse is just like, so rich. There is so much, so much uh, gold in it. Now, it's also then famous for its theology. And for that reason, sometimes people think of Romans as a difficult book. Not because it's obscure or confusing, but it just it has a lot of theology in it. There's a lot of logic in the book of Romans. That's why sometimes it's easier to walk through it slowly. But Romans is also famous for its it's simplicity and clarity, meaning it speaks to the lost. You don't have to be a theologian to read this book. You don't have to be a seminary student to get something out of this book. If this is your first time in church, first time reading the Bible, this book and this word today can bring you to salvation Amen. Amen. because it's God's word. Amen. You know, this book was used uh, by God to bring Martin Luther to salvation. It was used by God to bring Augustine to salvation. So many people who have been brought to salvation because of this book. And why is that? Well, it's because the book is really about the gospel. Theologians say that this book is simply Paul's treatise on the gospel. So for however long we spend in this book, what we're going to be doing is page after page, line after line, word after word, we're just going to be looking at the gospel message. The gospel. The gospel of God, as Paul calls it in verse 1. Now, uh, in modern day letters, we start off a letter by saying, you know, dear John. We, we begin our letters through the name of the person that we're writing to, and then we end it with our own name, Love Joel, or usually it's Much Love Joel. That's the way I tag every one of my letters. Um, now, Paul tags every one of his letters in a little different way than we do today. It begins with the author, the writer, Paul. And, and then he goes on to describe himself. Paul, a great man of God, a genius, a writer, an author, an intellect, an intellectual. Now, that's not how he starts off his letters, is he? does he? He starts off by saying, Paul, look how he describes himself, a servant of Christ Jesus. That word servant is the word doulos, which is uh, often translated slave. It's, it's a strong word, which means that Paul belongs body, soul, and spirit to Jesus Christ. You know, uh, someone once said that the first duty of every soul is to find not its freedom, but its master. And I think that's true. What that's saying is, is that your, your, the first duty of your soul is to not try to figure out how to be free. But the question that you have to answer is, who is your master? Or what is your master? Because our souls all serve something. We're wired to serve. And so your soul may serve your desires. Your soul may serve your whims. Your soul may serve your flesh. Your soul may serve people pleasing. Paul says his soul belongs to Jesus. A servant of Christ Jesus. And then he says called to be an apostle. Everybody say apostle. Apostle, apostle is, a, is a big word in the New Testament uh, which basically says that, they, that he is marked out specifically by God to take a new revelation to God's people in a very unique sense that doesn't exist today. Meaning, Paul is writing Romans. 
well, why is it that we believe that this is God's word? It's because of that word right there. Because he's called to be an apostle. Meaning this is not his message. Yes, it is Paul's message in a sense. He is writing this. But it's God's message. God has given Paul this message to share to, the, uh, uh, to, to Romans and to us today. So therefore, this, this whole book is God's word. Called to be an apostle. Now, he goes on to explain that the gospel message is God's message. You see, I am convinced that we are dealing with here God's truth that we are to receive. Like, are Christians smarter than non Christians? Are, did Christians or the Christian tradition kind of come up with a better message than non Christians? No. What we believe is that, is that this is actually God's message, that this is actually God's truth. And our job is, is, is to receive it, to believe it. The gospel is from God. Look at verse 1. Let me read the whole verse again. It says, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Look at those words. The gospel of God. That word of means that the gospel belongs to God. It's his message. For example, if you were to say for, uh, uh, for Black, Black History Month, you're going to read the works of Frederick Douglass. What, what are you saying? You're, you're going to be reading the thoughts and the ideas and the writings that belong to who? Frederick Douglass. Or if I were to say, this shoe collection is the shoes of Tim Carey. That means that these shoes belong to who? Tim Carey. And so if Paul says that this is the gospel of God, then who owns the gospel? Who, who does the gospel belong to? The gospel is God's message. It's good news that comes from God himself. Now, Paul goes on in verse 2 to, to sort of prove this, if you would. He goes back a thousand years, and he's basically saying, look, I didn't come up with this message. What I'm about to tell you isn't Paul's gospel. This isn't the Christian tradition. This isn't just something that Christians have come up with, or evangelicals, or Protestants, or whatever uh, uh, tagline you want to put on it. But what he's about to say is something that goes back thousands of years about a thousand years in his case, look at verse 2, he says, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. So this whole uh, 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 thousand year period building up to Paul's ministry was a preparation phase, he's saying, for Jesus Christ. Meaning the Old Testament was about who? Come on somebody. Jesus Christ. You, this gospel was promised beforehand. Yeah. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Let's go back. Moses. Let's go back. Uh, Noah. Let's go all the way back, all the way back to Adam. Yeah. Meaning all of the Old Testament saints were living in this era, preparing the way for one who would come and hang on a cross and die for the sins of God's people. The gospel then is not some kind of plan B, like, oops, the Old Testament didn't work out, let's try a different route. But the gospel of Christ was God's plan A since Adam. It's God's message. The gospel is from God. And what's, what's the gospel about? Well, is it merely about the forgiveness of sins for people? Is it merely about uh, a new life that you can live, new commands? 
Is the gospel merely about you? And I would say, yes, the gospel involves a new life. The gospel involves the forgiveness of sins. And the gospel, thankfully, involves you. But the gospel is about God. And that's my second point. The gospel is from God. And the gospel is about God. Look at verse 3. He says, uh, uh, set apart for the gospel of God concerning His Son. Now, now in our immaturity, we want to be the center of attention. We kind of want that to say, set apart for the gospel of God concerning you. Because I want to be in the spotlight. I want to be at the center of attention. Like when I come home and all four of my kids are talking over each other, trying to talk to me. They want my attention, right? That's, that's something that we crave is, is to have the attention of the one that we love. And so I can understand that, but I would say that it's an immaturity in our faith to, to think that way about the gospel. Yeah. I remember as a child myself, this, this thought kind of dawned on me that Jesus Christ will always be at the center. Not me. And that was kind of a hard truth for me. I got a little jealous about Jesus. I'm not kidding. But why is that? It's because we don't understand our sin. We don't understand our need for Jesus to be at the center. I mean... Imagine with me for a moment if this actually came and said the gospel of God, the gospel concerning your responsibilities, or the gospel concerning your obedience before God, or I've come to proclaim the gospel of God, the gospel of what God requires of you. You see, so often we wrongly think of the gospel as a list of things that we must do. News that we receive, maybe good things, but things that we must do nonetheless. Like when I woke up yesterday morning and I thought I had this nice, long, relaxing Saturday ahead of me and my wife gives me a to-do list. Good things, by the way. We have a birthday party happening for our son that night. But I think sometimes we think of the gospel in the same way. There's something we must prepare for, something that we must do, some kind of mission that we have to be on, something good that we have to be about. And actually, for those of us that are prideful, this actually appeals to our pride. Don't tell me about what somebody did. Tell me about what I can do. And so, that, so, so we wrongly think that the gospel is a list of things that we must do. And what I'm telling you is, if that's the case, we are all going to hell. Because there is no work that you can do through which you would be saved. And if you are trusting in your works to be saved, you are on your way to hell. And I want you to see Christ this morning. I want you to be happy in the gospel this morning because what we're talking about is something that Christ has done. It's good news. Yeah. Martin Lloyd-Jones, preaching through Romans, he said, he said, we don't understand how good this good news actually is. Yeah. And why is that? It's because we don't understand how sinful we actually are. We don't actually understand how wonderful the Savior really is and our inability to save ourselves. An old professor of mine uh, used this as an analogy. He said, imagine a man with diabetes who went to the doctor, and the doctor said, okay, this is what you must do. You've got to drink three gallons of water a day. You need to eat five pounds of vegetables today and, uh, every day, and you, you need to run eight miles every day. Now go ahead. About a week later, the man comes back, and he says, I can't do it. I failed. And the doctor says, I knew you would fail. Well, why did you require it of me? The man asks. The doctor says, so that you would know that you need my help. Now take this pill. 
You see, the law comes to us and condemns us. The law of God comes to us and requires something of us that we cannot do. Like the old Saturday Night Live skit uh, where the counselor just simply says, Stop it! Stop it! Just stop your sin, the law says. Oh, go ahead and try that, church. Everybody, just for a moment, think of the one sin that you regularly are, are going back to and struggling with. Now, just stop. Please, stop it. Oh, do you understand now the need for grace? <laughs> the law requires of us what we cannot do. It, it, it then leads us to this place where we say, I need a gospel, not about me. Not about requirements, not about my obedience. I need a gospel concerning the Son. Who is the Son that he talks about here in verse 3? You see, as important as it is to know the content of the gospel, we must know the God of the gospel. The most important question any one of us faces is simply this. How can a sinner be made right before God? He says this gospel is concerning his son. Verse 3. Not just information, but it's about a person. Who was he? He goes on to introduce to us Jesus. He was descended from David according to the flesh. According to the flesh. Now that means in his humanity. Jesus is eternally God. He was there at the beginning with God. He was God. He is God. He spoke and all things came into existence. And there was a promise then made to David, King David in the Old Testament, that one through his actual seed would become the King, the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And so what Paul's saying is, is that God became flesh. This is referring to His humanity. He took on flesh and He actually is uh, uh, part of the lineage of King David. Here Paul references Jesus' humanity. In His huma man humanity, the Bible says that Jesus became weak. Well, what does that mean? He became weak. I saw someone say uh, recently, this last week, uh, say, they said gentleness is strength under control. Uh, weakness is having no strength. The Bible says Jesus became weak. Yes, he was also gentle. But he gave up his strength taking on the form of a servant, being obedient to death, even the death of the cross. On the cross, in His humanity, Jesus was mocked. He was made fun of by humans. He was beaten. He was bruised. He was crushed for our transgression. He who knew no sin became sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. You see, the Gospel has the cross at the very center of it. The blood of Christ will forever be our theme in glory. The Gospel, however, doesn't end with Jesus' humanity or His death. Even though Jesus still today is in human form. He is not dead. This is Paul's next summary. Descended from David according to the flesh, he goes on, and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by His resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. What's he saying here? He's saying that at the resurrection of Christ, Jesus inaugurated a whole new era. 
No longer was Jesus weak. No longer is Jesus clothed in weakness. But now Jesus is clothed in power. As a new era is ushered in. And with his resurrection, he said he's declared to be the Son of God. Everybody say that word, declared. Now notice he didn't say made to be the Son of God. He doesn't become the Son of God at his resurrection. But his resurrection declares him to be the unique Son of God. Like, like, a, like, a, uh, like the son of a king who is the heir to the throne. And then on that day of his coronation, he receives the crown and the royal robe. Well, he's always been the heir to the throne. That's always been his identity, the son of the king. But now it is, it is shown. He's glorified. It's clearly seen. And what he's saying is, is when Jesus was put to death, his bloody body put into the ground, and that grave shook three days later, early on a Sunday morning, the stone rolled away and he appeared to his disciples risen. He's saying that that was his coronation. That was his declaration. Clothed in, in glory. Brought in a new era. By the way, to create a whole new people. For all who trust in Jesus Christ. Turning from their sins, saying, Christ is my hope. The Bible says that we too will one day rise from the dead with Christ. Freed from even the presence of sin. Given a new body. This creates then a whole new humanity. And that's what this is about. That's what this new age is about. Is God's work of redemption for people, sinners like us. So I've got two, two big parts here. The first part I've already covered, and that is simply this. The gospel is God's message. Are you with me? The second part of Romans 1, 1 through 7 is the gospel is the believer's hope. The gospel is God's message. And this gospel is your hope. After three verses of, of summarizing the gospel message, in verse 5, Paul transitions back to the reason that he is an apostle. So look at verse 5 with me. He says, through Jesus, Paul, he, he has received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. For the sake of his name among the nations, including you who are called to Jesus Christ. The obedience of faith. Well, is this a list of things that we must do? Certainly not. Because we're saved not by works of righteousness, Paul writes elsewhere, but by grace through faith. Well, what does he mean then by the obedience of faith. Most scholars believe that what this simply means is, is, is obedience, which consists of having faith. Meaning, the gospel message is not an option, but an order. The gospel message is not a preference, but a proclamation. The gospel is the only option, and you are commanded to believe. The obedience of faith. My son Haddon recently started boxing at Umar Boxing up the street, and while I'm there, I'm like realizing, like, man, this is just a great place to exercise and, and for people to, who, who want to exercise to, to get in and get something done. And so I mentioned it to, uh, to Nisea and to Angelo because they want to exercise. I'm like, hey, check out Umar Boxing. It might be, a, might be an option for you. It might be an option for you. Now, the YMCA is also an option. Planet Fitness is also an option. CrossFit is also an option. It's an option. Just an option. 
And I think that's the way a lot of us approach Jesus Christ. He's an option for some. And, and church, I believe that sometimes, even when we're sharing the gospel with the lost, we present him as an option. You know, if it's your thing, if you would like to, if you want to. The Bible never says, believe in Jesus if you want to. It's a command church. It's a matter of obedience church. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only option for sinners to be made into saints. There is no other planet fitness option where you're going to be made into a saint. There's no YMCA option where you're going to be made into a saint. This is the only option. And so Paul, as he describes the gospel, he calls it the obedience of faith. What was the original sin of Adam? Was it not that he failed to obey God in belief? He failed to believe God's word. What was the original sin of Israel? What was the sin of Israel that led them into captivity? Was it not that they failed to believe God's word? Now, we don't like this because, you know, I feel like, shoot, I, I need my options. And if it's a requirement as a, as a good old American, well, then that means that I can't do it with delight. Because he's, are you requiring this of me, Jesus? Well... I don't know. I would have rather you just presented this as one of many options. Is it delight for you or is it duty? Well, I want to argue that this option is the only option and that you are commanded to believe the gospel and that it is your delight. Let me, let me use an example. Think of Hosea. I feel like I use Hosea as an example once a year or so. Think of Hosea running after his erring wife, running after his adulterous wife, buying her out of prostitution. In chapter 3 of Hosea, what does Hosea tell his wife? He says, you are mine, and you will live with me, and I will be yours. That's not an option, but it's love. If he presented an option, it would not have been love. If you think of a, a wife who's considering stepping outside of her marriage and her husband says, I love you, and she says, I don't believe it. And he says, you must believe it. You must believe that I love you. That's not an option. If he gave her an option, that would not be love. Love. Don't you understand, church, that when God commands us to believe the gospel, it's rooted in his love for us. And if anything, if he gave us any less, if it was like, well, you know, if you would like to, you, you may believe. No, 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 no. He requires it. What does Jesus say in Mark chapter 1, verse 15? He says, the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the kingdom. Period. Church. Obey the gospel. Believe the gospel. What is the message for scandalous Rome? What is the message for this sin-sick city in love with its own pride? What is the directive to the sinner? There is only one option, and that is this. You must believe the gospel. It is your only option. The gospel is the only option, and the gospel transforms sinners into saints. How does Paul begin the letter to Romans? What's the first word? Somebody? Anybody? Paul. I mean, even when we read that first word, we have to just pause and give God glory. For the fact that God transforms sinners into saints. Paul, 
an enemy of Christ, breathing out murderous threats against the Christians, a rebel, a rejecter of God who met Jesus and was transformed and something like scales fell off of his eyelids. The gospel transformed Paul. It's for man's good. One pastor explained it this way. He said there are two rival passions in life. The first passion is God's passion for his own glory. The gospel is God's. The gospel is about God. God has a passion for his own glory. But there's a second passion. And the second passion is, is, is humans, the human's passion for our happiness. And these two passions seem to rival one another. And this is often your problem, is that you have a passion for your own happiness, and you feel as if it goes against God's glory. But here's the beauty of the gospel. In the gospel message, these two passions are married. You see, God's greatest glory is your happiness. Or we could put it the other way around. Your happiness is in God's greatest glory. The gospel is actually for your good. This is why Paul was so passionate about it. He didn't see his old life as better and he finally submitted to Jesus, but rather he found Jesus uh, introducing him to a better life to more happiness, to actual joy that transcends the problems of this world. Our brother Eric often says the gospel makes a man happy. Amen? C.S. Lewis put it this way. He said sometimes when Christ has allowed you to overcome an obvious sin or two in your life, you feel like, okay, I'm good enough. I had these two or three sins that I wanted to get over, and now I got over with them, and I hope that God will just leave me alone now. But he keeps messing with you. He says, it's, it's almost like you're a house. Imagine you're a house. And, uh, and God comes in, and he fixes some of the plumbing, yeah, that makes sense. Plumbing needed to be fixed. He, he fixes a leak in the roof. Yeah, that, that leaky roof needed to be fixed. But then he said that God then starts shaking up the whole house. And he's doing stuff, and you don't understand what he's doing. He's, you realize like he's, he's putting on a whole new floor. He's changing the entryway. He's adding rooms. He's throwing up towers. He's putting in courtyards. And at first, you don't like it. He's doing too much. And you were happy with this quaint little cottage of a house. But what you've realized is that God is building a palace. And it's a palace for your good. A better house. A better life. And it's a palace that God himself is going to dwell in. My point is this, is that the gospel is God's glory and your good. The gospel is God's pleasures and your happiness. This is why, church, Paul has the audacity to use the words then that he uses in verse 7. If you look at that verse again with me, he says, To all those in Rome who are loved by God, that's a big word, loved by God, look at this, called to be saints, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Loved by God. Called to be saints. Roman citizens called to be saints. Once marked by the passions of the flesh. Once marked by the desires of the body. The rejection of God's slaves of the empire, loved by God, called to be saints by God. Oh, and are these saints just a few really good Christians? 
Like so often when we use the word saint in modern day English, we'll, we'll refer to like the really good Christians from times past, like, like Saint Augustine or Saint Anselm. But Paul uses this word for all of the Christians in Rome. You're all saints. In the book of Daniel, God, uh, Daniel is looking forward to this day in which uh, uh, the, the kingdom of God is going to come. And Daniel says that those who receive this kingdom are saints. Now Paul uses that word to, to refer to every single Christian in Rome. You are the recipients of God's kingdom. You are marked out. You are owned by God. And this is why Paul in verse 16, jumping forward, says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. This also applies to us in Baltimore. 347 homicides in 2021. Saints. Greed, intoxication, injustice, manipulation. Saints. Addicted to desire, pursuing the flesh. Saints. Now is this a bad people out there versus good people in here? No. Not at all because none of us are a saint because we're good. Look at the passive words in here. They're made different. They're loved by God. They're called to be saints. And that's what we are. This is what the gospel has done. Look no more. We have arrived, church. Amen. You know, sometimes I'm always looking forward to the next thing. You know what that's like? Like, for instance, I wake up in the morning and I'm looking forward to having coffee. And while I'm drinking my coffee, I'm looking forward to getting something done. And then while I'm getting things done throughout the day, I'm looking forward to dinner. And then when I'm eating dinner, I'm looking forward to dessert. And then when I'm eating dessert, I'm looking forward to putting the kids to bed so I can read a book. And then when I'm reading a book, I'm looking forward to going to sleep. And then when I sleep, I'm looking forward to coffee in the morning, like it all revolves around coffee. We're always looking forward to the next thing. We're always waiting for something more. It's almost as if we can get into the cycle of looking forward to our salvation, looking forward to our fulfillment, looking forward to our satisfaction, waiting for that next thing that's going to come along and complete us. And then when our Messiahs don't deliver, we turn to wicked vices. So I guess I want to close with this question. How can you be happy in all of the waiting of this life? Some of you may remember that day on March 5th, 2020, when we were together at a, a, a hospital in the waiting room while little baby Savannah Madden was having surgery repairing a hole in her heart. And we were completely unsure how this surgery would go. But that night as we sat in the waiting room with the family, we began to sing songs and we began to pray. Waiting. I use that merely as an example to say all of life is really a waiting room. Not sure of how things are going to go. Not really sure of what's next. How does a family sit in a waiting room? We sing, we pray, we look to God. You see, all through the Old Testament, they were looking for something more. They were waiting for something more. The Bible says that Abraham was looking for the city with foundations. The Bible says that Moses was looking for the reward. That uh, uh, Anna was looking for redemption in Jerusalem. That Simeon was looking for the Messiah to come to rescue God's 
people. And Romans chapter 1, 1 through 7 comes along and says, look no more. The wait is over. Satisfaction has come. Completion has come. Fulfillment has come. Meaning I can sit in all of the waiting rooms of life because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the seed of David, has come, has died for us, and has rose in power over the dead. And this is why the revelation or the angel in Revelation says, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered. Rome doesn't define you. Christ defines you. Rome doesn't own you. Christ owns you. Rome hasn't conquered you. Christ has conquered Rome. Believe, saints, in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Loved by God. Called to be saints. Is that you? Is that you? Are you saved? Have you turned to Christ? Do you have the assurance that you are loved by God? Set apart for Him. Dedicated to His service. Well then, grace and peace, Paul says. Grace and peace. In the middle of Baltimore City. From God our Father. And from our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hope of the gospel. Father, as we study this book, I pray that you would drill in us this gospel message that Jesus Christ is our hope. Salvation by grace through faith. And I pray that every man, woman, and child in this room today will obey the gospel, that they will believe, that they will receive Christ loved by You, called to be saints. May we be marked as a different people in Baltimore City. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.